Welcome to SciTech Culture with Steve Kern and Ben Warner, where we examine science, technology, and culture in the 21st century. Visit our website at scitechculture.com. Hello and welcome to SciTech Culture. My name is Ben Warner and I'm joined once again by my good friend and colleague Steve Kern. How are we today, Steve? Um, I'm uh, enjoying a, a nice day indoors today because it's just bucketing outside and it's the way I like it. And given it's lockdown, it's like the perfect weather for it. <laughs> it's not much better here in terms of it's very cold and wintry and yeah, it's just an easy day to stay at home and avoid whatever dangers there are out in the streets. Absolutely. The zombie apocalypse notwithstanding. <laughs> um, all right. So we've got a couple of things that we're going to cover today um, and just uh, jump through. Um, just picking up on our sort of conspiracy theory threads from last week. Um, obviously, we were focusing on COVID-19 ones um, last week, but I um, thought it was just interesting to touch on uh, this QAnon stuff um, out of America and more to... I guess, focus on not so much them, but the fact that uh, Trump was um, basically tacitly endorsing them this week by saying that, oh, I've, I haven't heard anything about it, but I hear they like me. And, you know, if if they think I can save the world, I'm more than happy to help out, you know, using rhetoric like that, which is typically a softball for a politician to say, you know, to denounce them. But he, he, he obviously always does the exact opposite of what um you're expecting and it's not so much that this group exists or whoever they are or whatever they're promoting or whatever crazy stuff that they're going on about it's more that it's um it's going through the bullhorn at, you know, of the uh the white house press room straight out of trump's mouth um which is the difference thing the different thing here well, it's very different, and it's very different from uh, last time around. So last time around, these sorts of things he was removed from. So while he might have uh, directly attacked Hillary, uh, you know, verbally through Twitter, uh, there were dark forces that were running these very strange misinformation campaigns mm -hmm. accusing the, the opposition of, of bizarre claims, you know, like things that any reasonable person would just know weren't true. Yeah. However, this time around, he's choosing to uh, really ignite these uh, these claims himself. And to me, that uh, suggests a very different tactic. Mm. And it's obviously a, a tactic very carefully prepared uh, to get support directly for him as the underdog. Yeah, exactly. A bit like uh, just channeling whatever, whatever form of self-promotion he can find and getting all these people to do it for him effectively in an environment where, um, you know, potentially, you know, he may need all the help that he can get in the lead up to the election this year. Well, that's the key. He needs all the help he can get. So he'll now attempt to get any group, no matter how small in actual number, mm. but if he can accumulate votes across the board, uh, through, you know, half harebrained conspiracy sort of theory for a group that may or may not even exist yeah. but will attract people under his umbrella, he'll take it. He'll take it if he can get uh, college students on board with some sort of uh, fear about what might happen. He'll take it if he can get someone else on board, you know, with a fear for, say, something, you know, like the corona's going to ruin the US and, you know, if there's any, uh, you know, international or global policy you know, threat that he can uh, engender to get anyone else, mm. he'll just cobble them all together and hopefully, he's, he's praying, he'll get 50.1 of the vote. Well, okay, that's probably a good uh, place to s sort of segue into the DNC coverage from uh, this week with um, the Democrats doing their, uh, you know, typical convention prior to, uh, you know, the lead up to the election and, uh, you know, getting Biden his official endorsement, etc. So to be the president and Kamala Harris for vice president. Uh, I guess what was different this time, just from a, maybe if we focus on the technical aspect, was that um, it wasn't done, you know, with uh, thousands and thousands of people around um, all uh, doing their votes etc it was um, all done virtually because of the COVID situation and uh, so you didn't have the cheering crowds and um, people you know raising their hand to you know cast their their ballots or whatever it is that they do um, you know yell at each other whatever um, so it was a de definitely an interesting change uh, least of which it 
maybe this is a good thing. It lead, led to uh, shorter speeches and uh, and all that sort of stuff just to get the same point across. Um, I thought there was a couple of um, effective speeches in there too. Um, but the interesting thing being that um, aside from the, I guess, the technical delivery where there wasn't that usual pomp and circumstance, uh, I guess, surrounding it, despite the I guess the Hollywood production values that they put into it. Um, there seemed to be that overarching narrative that they weren't really pushing policy. It was more about, no, we're battling for the soul of the country here. We've got the guy that can, um, you know, deliver on that and we can't afford four more years of Trump effectively. So it was an interesting couple of days and uh, it'll be uh, interesting to see if uh, that message actually managed to get out there and resonate with people when that immediate feedback wasn't there yeah i look i don't want to be disparaging but that message i think is pretty much all the democrats have got this time around Mm -hmm. Uh, i you know i think their choice of biden is just plain weird like uh not that i'd support or even want to see bernie sanders running but he would have made more sense i guess from an external looking in perspective um And, I mean, they're kind of burdened with a weird thing, which I'm sure Trump will go for, which is uh, a vote for Biden to vote for Kamala Harris. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) She she could well be president within two years. So, Mm. and he'll use any trick now to destabilise them. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Mm. Because that message is strong, but I'm not sure that the team they have is strong. Yeah, well, that, well, maybe um, the the one thing that they needed to do, I mean, we've sort of joked um, in the past about uh, Biden's lucidity, for lack of a better term, but um, the one thing that he was able to do in that speech was actually to present himself uh, convincingly enough to say that he could actually stand up and actually speak for half an hour without uh, tripping over his words or um, forgetting things or whatever, which is counter to the narrative that's been coming out recently about whether or not he can actually do that. But you know he had the auto cue. Yeah. I mean, you know, I want to see him actually like freestyle it, and uh, that that's the big test. If he can do that, then I'll believe the Democrat uh, sort of you know uh, you know call to arms hmm. uh, about repairing and and moving on from uh, the last four years. I'll believe it. But I mean, it's probably an effect of COVID, but. We really haven't seen enough of Biden to know what he's like. Well, then uh, maybe it's Have just uh, maybe it's just uh, something that has to be done in stages. So this this is like my uh, devil's advocate uh, explanation here, being that uh, this first speech was enough to kind of you know you know settle some potential doubts maybe mm-hmm. and then maybe it's the move into the uh, presidential debates where he will have to freestyle it um to be able to get through it apart from you know the usual um statements that they have to make um which obviously they can prepare ahead of that um obviously there's going to be some instances in those debates where trump will throw him some curveballs um and uh he will see then whether or not he's uh, he can stand up to it well, I just want to see them go one-on-one mentally yeah. at each other and let, let's see who's impaired and who's not. <laughs> Absolutely. It'll be a definite uh, quality TV entertainment, uh, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I think we'll just change tack from that now, swing, swinging away from politics and uh, back to some uh, some tech news, although I guess politics is involved in this one to an extent as well. Um, the topic, uh, and it's funny, like you mentioned it, um, oh, do you want to do Google versus Australia today? And then I had to think about it for a sec because I hadn't actually read up too much about it, but I had seen those prompts in YouTube from Google telling me, oh, did you know about what um, what's coming up uh, for Australian users, etc.? And I remember being irritated by that prompt and wanting to uh, hit the X on it every time I kept seeing it. But having said that, I went back and had a look at what um, uh, what they were talking about <laughs> in that about effectively. Um, uh, this thing that the government, the ACCC, want to uh, develop a code uh, to. What would be the the best way to put it um, for, I guess, traditional media outlets to be paid more money bec- uh, from Google from the simple fact that Google lists their articles on Google and doesn't really, um, you know, effectively... Uh, it's, it's like they're not earning the money from uh, having them hosted there. Um, 
<clears throat> and uh, Google obviously went through and said, oh, they're going to, you know, the, the, in the open letter that they put out about um, they're going to screw up, um, you know, the way uh, user searches work um, when, you know, Australians are going to lose out on um, quality search uh, information, et cetera, et cetera, um, affecting all of Google's platforms and the government sort of bought the ACCC hitting back saying, no, that's not the case. You know, if they they don't have to, you know, um, you know, change anything if they don't want to, etc. It just seemed to me that um, the government's probably just going to put this through anyway, and uh, you know, no amount of what Google's going to, you know, jump up and down about. I don't know if anything's going to change from that perspective. Well, Google's threatened to withdraw YouTube and search services which is interesting, I think, uh, but there's a lot at stake here. So it's not just that Google might have to pay for Australian uh, media content. If they did, then the Australian government would also have a basis for uh, probably taxing them as well. (laughs) So, So if Australia was to be successful, then basically everyone else is going to pile on and Google will find itself... uh, not getting everything its own way. Mm. I mean, their response to try and scare people uh, into supporting Google has been quite incredible. Mm. And the Australian government's been quite strong hitting back, so they've released now the fact that if you've got an Android phone, basically unless you root the phone and completely bypass the Google uh, acceptances, which you have to do, yeah. uh, Google tracks even if you turn everything off, and we know that anyway. So they're putting a lot of pressure on Google. I don't know. I mean, uh, you didn't sound like Google won you over with their little uh, ad box. Well, yeah, I'm, I mean, <clears throat> it. J- I guess with them, uh, it's uh, it's a question of what's your angle, um, like uh, especially because it was worded in a way that it was oh it's going to put you know we're we're looking out for you, and we and you just know that they're not, and that's the uh, the, the 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 tone that's coming from that. Having said that, I'm not necessarily um, you know uh, thinking all there's all things altruistic is happening on the government side either, in the sense of why why all of a sudden are they interested in um, in doing that on this particular topic and I can only imagine or suggest that there might be some media interests that um, are pressing the government on that. As well as a tax dollar for the government. Mm. That's, that's the payoff. So, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, <laughs> it's all about vested interests. But, you know, you know once again, and I, I can't really side with Google on this, but mm. by the same token, It kind of really upsets me that governments are now coming in 15 years later to regulate this. Mm -hmm. Well after the horse is bolted and it just, you know, it rankles of self-interest on that side of things anyway. I I mean, look, ultimately I hope Google does withdraw its services just to teach the Australian government a a lesson Mm. and we get an Australian version of the YouTube platform by some local entrepreneurs and uh, an Australian search engine or maybe we can just all stick with DuckDuckGo, (laughs) which, as we know, really doesn't work that well, but at least they don't track you. (laughs) (laughs) That would definitely be a very different uh, internet experience to say the least. Um, It certainly would, but, you know, Google will get over you. I was going to say too that um, this should affect um, Facebook, I would have thought, but it seems like Facebook have, um, I don't know, come to some sort of deal or arrangement already um, and have left Google to, I guess, make, make take a stand on their own. Well, I think in the first instance it's the Google search content for media mm. and then I think after, if they're successful with Google, then Facebook will have to do pretty much their own deal, but it'll be in the same framework as Google's. Yeah. Um, but I think it's slightly different because the argument is is that Facebook actually publishes news and then it's complicated by the fact that you've got traditional news outlets publishing on Facebook. Yeah. Whereas Google, it's straight up. They, they basically take the news and then repackage it. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, well, I'm sure we'll see what the uh, the stoush is, uh, is like and then um, I guess we might have to create a, I don't know, a SciTech culture channel on the uh, replacement YouTube 
version that we end up getting in Australia and uh, the rest of the world will be shut off from us. But, oh, well, we had a good run, didn't we? <laughs> well, we, we uh, look, I, I will just say this, though, that, you know, YouTube was a revolutionary uh, platform back in 2010 or 2008, whenever it really started to take off. Hmm. Um, but now... It's just a, it's a white label platform. Anyone could purchase one. The thing is that, you know, YouTube has the predominant position. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like anyone could take YouTube's place. So I really don't think Google are going to hobble it in Australia. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, Steve, we might uh, wrap it up there. So um, don't forget our website, SciTechCulture.com. You can get all of our links and content there. Watch us on Vimeo, YouTube, and uh, listen to us on our via our RSS feeds, etc. Watch us on any and all of your, device, of your devices, and uh, we greatly appreciate your visits to our website. All right, so that's it for this episode. We'll catch you next time.